Okay, so in the previous class, we were talking about periodic signals. And one of the things we talked about was if you take harmonically related exponential complex exponential signals and you take a linear combination of them, um, you get a periodic signal. And that part was easy, that's straightforward. What was non-obvious is if X is if X is a periodic signal and it satisfies Dirichlet's condition, the three conditions, the Dirichlet condition that we talked about in the previous class. So if it satisfies those three condition, turns out that XT can be written in the form of uh, the sum of complex exponential signals um, that are harmonically related. And that's really a very, very uh, cool and a, a result with far reaching consequences. And this is known as Fourier series expansion of the signal XT of the periodic signal XT. So today we are going to talk about how to compute the Fourier series coefficients, these AK, how do you compute it? And that's what we'll be discussing in today's class. Okay, so what are we given? We are given that XT is periodic. with fundamental period capital T. This is given to us. And assuming that XT satisfies the Dirichlet's condition, we're going to implicitly assume, of course, the Dirichlet's conditions are all pathological conditions. So, um, so in real world situations, those conditions will most likely not be satisfied. Uh, in other words, I don't know of any real world situation where Dirichlet's conditions would be violated. Then I know from the Fourier series theorem that I can write XT as summation, K goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. AK of phi KT, where phi KT is given by E raised to JK omega naught T and omega naught is equal to two pi over capital T. Now the question in today's class is how to compute AK. Okay, this is what we are going to discuss today. So let's let me ask you one question. Okay, let's say so this is a linear algebra question. So I'm going to digress a little bit. A linear algebra question, let's say I'm given a vector V is a vector in Rn. And let's say V1 and V2, or not V1 and V2, let's say E1 to En, these are also vectors in Rn and they are mutually orthogonal. and they form the base for Rn. So you can, which means that you can write any vector V in the form of A1, E1 plus An, En. All of you remember this from linear algebra? No. No? <laughs> Anyone else who remembers this from linear algebra? Yes. Okay. So some people remember it, some people don't. Well, okay, fine. So let's just take, so what are mutual, mutually orthogonal bases? So EI transpose EJ equals to zero for I not equals to J. And 
let's let's not assume the unit or maybe we should assume the unit uh, norm also ei transpose ei equals to 1 which means that ei is uh, orthonormal basis uh, the norm of ei is equal to 1 okay so this is the definition of orthonormal basis let's just take my word for it that any vector v uh, vector v in rn could be written in the form of a1 e1 all the way up to an en and let's say the question is how do i compute the value of ak in this situation so anyone remembers how do i compute the value of ek ak at least those who remember ortho orthogonal basis and and the fact that you can write a vector in the form of a linear sum of basis functions oh, sorry not basis function but linear sum of basis vectors Remem anyone remembers what how do we compute the value of ak in this case you can do a dot product with ek that's right so v transpose ek or if you want to write it in the dot product um, case then it's uh, an inner product of v comma ek so both of them are equivalent uh, operations so you can compute ak by taking the dot product with the original vector v. Now we are in a similar situation above. Uh, we are in a similar situation above where we know the value of xt, uh, where we have a signal xt, so that acts like a vector v. And I know that there are mutually orthogonal bases, so uh, we are going to talk about why phi kt forms a mutually orthogonal basis, but they are mutually orthogonal bases. And the way to find ak would be to take the dot product of xt with phi k of t. Okay, so this is what we are going to do. It's basically just mimicking exactly the same set of steps you would have taken if you were doing some linear algebra um, stuff. And why this is true? Well, you will have to take several graduate math classes to learn why this operation is completely justified. But I wanted to give you an intuition that this is exactly going to mimic the steps we take in the linear algebra class. So let's get to the dirty work. I'm going to prove, so the dot product equivalent in the case of signals and systems. Is the following. I'm going to take the integral of phi k of t uh, and phi j of t dt, and this goes from zero to t. And I'm going to show that this is actually equal to zero for all j not equal to k. Actually, there should be let me think. Actually, I should put a minus j here. So that would be the dot product equivalent. Uh, let's look at the integral, the actual integral. So I have e raised to j k omega naught t. That's my phi k of t and e raised to o. I cannot use j because j is already used. Let me use n minus j n omega naught t. So I'm using j for the complex number. So I don't want to use j as an index. Dt. Ah, so Someone has asked me a question, can we consider functions as vectors with infinite dimensions? That's exactly true. That's how mathematicians treat functions as. They are vectors with infinite dimensions. Okay. So, so this is the inner product. Let's consider this inner product. I'm going to integrate between zero to capital T, zero to capital T of E raised to J, K minus N omega naught T, dt 
what is this integral like? So let's assume that n is not equal to k. I'm going to consider n not equal to k. So this can be written as integral of zero to t cos k minus n omega naught t plus j sine k minus n omega naught t dt. Right, so now I have to compute two integrals. One is that of cos function and the other one is that of sine function. What do you think this integral is going to be equal to and why? So let's think about it, okay? Let's think about it. Let's draw this function cos. So this is t, this is capital T, this is zero. And K minus N is some integer. So this basically looks So my cos function is going to look something like this. This is what my cos functions look like. This is my cos of k minus n omega naught t. What is the integral of this function? I'm taking the integral with respect to time between zero to t. So I'm integrating this function in this particular interval. What's the integral equal to? Okay, I have a couple of answers, zero. Okay, good. So it's equal to zero and that's because the area above the time axis is equal to the area below the time axis. So between zero to T, the area above the time axis is equal to the area below the time axis. So the integral of cos between zero to T is going to be equal to zero. And the same thing is going to happen for sine as well. So in fact, this integral turns out to be equal to zero. This is the integral of phi kt phi star. So this is the complex conjugate phi minus nt dt. And this is equal to zero if k not equal to n. Because it's a complex number, number we have to take the conjugate um, in the dot product. So very simple uh, explanation for why the dot product is going to zero. You just plot the curve and you recognize that um, the area under the curve is equal to zero. And so the dot product will be zero as long as K is not equal to N. Now what happens when K is equal to N? This is zero to T. What is this equal to? Anyone wants to 
tell me what this equal what this value is going to be equal to big t it's capital t right that's great this is for k well this is for k equals to k yeah so all in all this is the major this is the main result that allows us to compute the Fourier series expansion. Okay, let's see how. Any any question so far? Any question on this integral? Okay, so let me let me go back to what we were discussing so far. So we know that I my xt is periodic. And from uh, the result from Fourier, we know that it can be because xt is periodic, I can write it as sum of these complex exponential signals. So I took a digression. I talked about the orthogonality of vectors and how to compute the coefficients in that case. And we want to just mimic the same step here as long as we can define a, a dot product between signals. So for periodic signals or for complex exponential signals, the dot product is defined in this particular fashion. This is the way to define the dot product. So once we have defined the dot product, uh, we, have to we have to show that actually the signals are orthogonal to each other. And that's what we have shown here, that if you multiply the signal with itself, with the conjugate of itself, you get the integral is equal to t. But if you multiply it with the conjugate of some other signal, what you get is the inner product is zero, the dot product is zero. So now we are going to exploit this in order to compute the value of AK. So remember, K equals to minus infinity to plus infinity. Now I'm going to multiply this xt with phi k conjugate t. And this integral is going to be from zero to capital T. What do I get? I get this integral of zero to capital T Okay, let me use some other n, p n star. P n star t dt. Okay, so I have an integral and then I have a summation and that entire summation gets multiplied to phi n star t and then we are taking the integral over dt. So what should we do next? Well, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this bracket. So multiply phi n star with each of these components and I'm going to take the summation outside. k equals to minus infinity to infinity, integral zero to t. I have a k phi k t phi n star t dt. Now, what do we get? The integral will be zero if k does not equal n, and right. it will be AKT else. That's right. So it will be a n t. Right. So this integral is equal to zero 
for all. Let me write it in a different color. It's an important point. So this integral is zero for all n not for all k not equal to n. Okay, so all we are left with is the term a and t. That's it. So we started with this integral. And we showed that this integral is actually equal to a n of t, which allows me to write the following expression. A n is equal to one over t integral zero to t x t e raised to minus j n omega naught t dt. Remember that omega naught is two pi over capital T, where capital T is the fundamental period. Okay, questions. Um, I have a question. Uh, I don't understand how uh, the integral uh, and summation be equal to a and t. Could you please explain that again? So you are saying this. How is this? These two equal? Um. Yeah. That and and uh, how is it equal to a and t? Uh, ultimately. Oh, I see. Okay. So you you want to know okay. this step? You want to know this step? Yeah. 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 Not yeah. this. Okay. Okay. Good. So this step follows because integral of f1 plus f2 is same as integral of f1 plus integral of f2, right? So because of this, uh, this holds, you can integral is sort of additive operator. So that's why we can go from the first equality to the second equality. Now let's look at the second to third in third equality. How do we get here? So I have this integral of ak phi kt phi and star t dt from zero to t. Now ak is a constant, so I can take the ak out and I have zero to t phi kt phi and star t dt. Now it turns out that this integral is equal to zero for k not equal to n and it's equal to t for k equals to n. And we just showed it in the previous, well, this should be a, a k t. We just showed it in the previous uh, slide. Let me go back to the previous slide to show you where it was. So this is what phi k multiplied by phi n star dt is equal to zero if k is not equal to n, right? So that's the result I'm using. And if you do the phi k times phi k conjugate, the integral is equal to t. So we are using this result that we proved a, a while ago to establish this result. And from here, I think it's, now you are just summing it up over all k. So now you have this summation, k goes from minus infinity to infinity of this integral dt, and that just a n t because all the terms are zero except for a and t. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Great. Any other question? Okay, so because integral is additive, I can take the summation outside. Um, of course, this is an infinite summation, so some care needs to be uh, you, you have to do it with some care, but in this case, we can do it because we are in a nice situation. We, we satisfy all the Dirichlet condition and all that stuff. So therefore, this, in, this uh, uh, interchange of integral with summation is justified. And 
Um, and, and then we are just using the fact that phi kt and phi n, phi n t, they are orthogonal signals for all k not equal to n. And so therefore the entire summation turns out to be equal to a n t. That allows me to compute a n t, a, a, a n as a function of the signal and then the complex exponential signal e raised to minus j n omega naught t. Okay. So this, this equation, this a n, what's wrong? Sorry. So this a n is called It's called Fourier series coefficient. So I have a Fourier series. Fourier series means I have numbers a minus infinity all the way to a plus infinity. And so these, these numbers are called Fourier series coefficients. They are also called spectral coefficient. So depending on which field you will eventually go to, if you do signal processing, you will call it Fourier series coefficient. If you go to some other electromagnetics type field, you will call it spectral coefficient. Okay. Great. So what we have learned so far, I have a periodic signal XT. I can actually write it in the form of AN or AK. K goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, E raised to J K omega naught T. And I can write a k as one over t integral zero to capital T x t e raised to minus j k omega naught t dt. This is called the synthesis equation. And this is called the analysis equation. Let's look at a couple of examples of computation of Fourier series coefficients. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's look at the first example. I'm going to pick a very, very simple equation sine of omega naught t. It's a periodic signal uh, with a fundamental period of two pi over omega naught. Now, I can of course go through this complex exercise of computing the Fourier series coefficients and whatnot, but let's try to be a bit more smart and remember that e raise, sine of omega naught t is e raised to j omega naught t minus e raised to minus j omega naught t over 2j, right? This is the Euler's relation. Which we studied in probably lecture two or lecture three. 
So I can actually write it in terms of Fourier coefficient where A1 is equal to one over two J, A minus one equal to minus one over two J and AK equals to zero for all K not equal to one and minus one. Fairly simple example, and I'm not using any of the complicated machinery of Fourier series and all that stuff right now. But now let's look at second example where I am going to use the Fourier series stuff. Uh, so I'm considering the following signal. This is my time T. Minus T1. T1, T over 2. And what else? This is capital T. Right, okay. This is minus T. Okay, and so the signal is as follows. and so on. Okay, so this is a periodic signal. Uh, it's a discontinuous signal. So at every minus T1, T1, and then T over two, uh, T minus T1 and T plus T1, this is all, there is a discontinuity in the signal. But it's a periodic signal. I can give the expression of xt as one if absolute value of t is less than t1 and zero if t1 is less than equal to absolute value of t less than equal to t over two. So that's the, that's the signal in this region and then it gets repeated, uh, it repeats itself every t time steps. This satisfies Dirichlet's condition. So the area under the curve is finite. It has finite energy. It doesn't have infinite number of discontinuities and it doesn't, it has a, uh, unique maximum and unique minimum within finite time interval. So I can compute, so according to Dirichlet's condition, we can compute the Fourier series expansion for this particular periodic signal. So let's try to compute that. Any questions so far? Okay, so in order to compute the Fourier series coefficient, remember that my A0 is zero to T xt dt, and then AK 
is one over t. Sorry, there should be one over t here. Zero to t. X t e raised to minus j k omega naught t, where omega naught is two pi over capital T. Now it turns out uh, that because my x t is periodic and e raised to minus j k omega naught t is periodic, all of these are periodic signals that we are talking about. I can take the limits of the integral from zero to t or minus t over two to capital T. So what I'm saying is I can also take this to be I'm going to get the same result because the signal is periodic. So the limits as long as I'm taking an interval from of, of length t capital T, it's fine. Uh, I can start the integral from any point and end at any point as long as the length of the interval is capital T. So let's try to evaluate the value of A naught Okay, any questions so far? Computed the value of A naught. Let's compute the value of AK using the same expression that I've given above. So if you do some manipulation, so this this uh, getting until here is pretty straightforward, uh, but you know trying to simplify this expression will take some effort. But what you can show is this number, this value is given by k pi. This is for k not equal to zero.
okay so this is how we compute the value of ak um, if you're asked to compute this in assignment or exam uh, you will have to get it to the final form of whatever that value of ak looks like okay so let's go back to the example we had this sort of square wave function not a square wave but uh, but but some rectangular wave function which is a periodic signal so we wanted to compute the fourier series coefficient for this periodic signal so i knew the expression for a0 and ak i just had to evaluate the expression so i found that a0 is equal to 2t1 over capital t and ak is given by sine of k omega not t1 over k pi just by evaluating the integral i didn't do anything sophisticated here but what i found after computing the fourier series coefficient is actually i can write x of t as 2 t1 over capital t which is the a not plus summation sin k omega not t1 over k pi k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity e raised to j k omega not t okay so i am writing this is a square wave this is a rectangular wave and this is sum of exponential complex exponentials or harmonically related complex exponentials what's the surprising thing you notice here anything surprising anything out of the out of the worldly here something that may not make much sense what doesn't make sense here this is a correct expression i'm not saying we did anything wrong so far everything is correct we have just followed what fourier told us to follow or what dirichlet told us to follow we have just done that but there's something i would say it's a little strange that there's a sine function and a rectangular wave right 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 yeah yeah so which sine function are you talking about is this the sine function you're talking about or is this the e raised to jk omega not t that you're talking about the uh, first one well the first one is actually just a constant so if you if, if you substitute k the value of k omega not t1 k and pi this is just some constant this okay. is real this is just some real number okay yeah but you are very close you are you are very close so this is actually a cosine and a sine function right so e raised to jk omega not t is actually a sum of a cosine plus j sine function so they are all infinitely differentiable very very smooth functions very nice functions however on the left side i have the signal x of t which actually is not differentiable at certain points in time because it's a rectangular wave function so it's not differentiable at every point where there is a discontinuity in the time domain so what we are seeing is the very very peculiar behavior where if you take the infinite sum so this is the infinite sum right so you take the infinite sum of cosine and sine functions which are very smooth function the infinitely differentiable function you can get a function which is actually not differentiable that's the that's the funny thing that's the peculiar thing that is happening in this particular equation and there's nothing wrong about it but 
this was one of the reasons why mathematicians were stuck for several years several decades actually in trying to discover this equation it took quite a lot of time to establish this result in a mathematically precise way it actually took about 100 years to get to this expression because earlier people didn't believe that you can take an infinite sum of differentiable function and get a non differentiable function but it turns out to be true okay any questions so far okay all right so another thing that you would notice is as you let k go to infinity plus infinity or minus infinity these coefficients sine of k omega not t1 over k pi that actually goes to zero so limit k absolute value of k goes to infinity sine of k omega not t1 over k pi is actually equal to zero okay so the magnitude of the exponential function the harmonically related complex exponential function the magnitude is going to zero as k goes to plus infinity or k goes to minus infinity okay that's another thing we notice here okay now let's say i ask you to generate this wave in uh, in an electrical circuit or something like that right and you probably can easily build a circuit that produces sine waves and now you have to add some gain to that sine wave and add up the entire signal in order to compute the value of xt now if you want to actually create the exact rectangular signal you will have to use infinite number of such circuits right and that's infeasible you can't have infinite number of circuits to produce a rectangular wave so what would you do you would probably approximate right you would approximate so you will say look i can't really build a rectangular wave exactly because uh, you know we we don't have the capacity to do that with so many infinite number of circuits so why don't we just do an approximation of a square wave so let's do an approximation okay and how do you get the approximation so let's say i am want to do i do this approximation x of nt which is 2 of t1 over t plus k equals minus n to plus n k not oh i should write k not equal to 0 i should write k not equal to 0 sin of k omega not t1 over k pi e raised to j k omega not t Okay, so I'm just truncating the entire Fourier series at capital N. I'm, I'm, I'm not considering the higher terms that are greater than capital N. So I will have an error, En of t, which is the original signal minus the approximated signal. This is the approximate signal. So one of the fact is that the energy of E and T goes to zero as N goes to infinity. So as you get better and better approximation, you start increasing the value of N 
the energy of the error, which is basically defined as integral of E and T square DT from zero to capital T, this energy actually goes to zero as capital N goes to infinity. So you're getting a better and better approximation of the original signal X of T. Okay, so let's look at a chart, which I picked up from book, which shows what happens as you increase the value of N. Okay, everyone ready to see it? All right, so this is N equals to one case and the error in this case is, well, maybe I'll use red, red color. This is the error. It's quite large error for n equals to one. This is n equals to three. And you see the error here, which is slightly smaller than the case when n is equal to one. Okay. Then n equals to seven is right here. This is n equals to seven. As you can see, the error is much smaller in comparison to n equals to three. And this is n equals to 19. And, you know, it's almost imperceptible. You know, there are some errors, small errors, but but, uh, but more or less it, it follows that, that rectangular wave function. And then finally, we get to n equals to 79. And you can see that the error is almost imperceptible uh, to, to normal eye, right? So as we go from n equals to when, where we saw a lot of error, we went to n equals to 79 and almost the error is negligible if you look at it. What else do we notice in this figure? Anything surprising in these figures? Just the bottom one where it uh, jumps up, it has little horns at the top and the bottom. Correct, correct, correct. Great. So as you can see around, so no matter which of the figures you are seeing, there is always an overshoot. This is called an overshoot. This is called an undershoot. So there are overshoots and undershoots. So this is overshoot and this is undershoot. So the signal is either overshooting when it's jumping up or the signal is undershooting when it's going down. And you see that the oscillations are reducing and then it increases again. And then the oscillations are very high when it goes down and then it decreases and then it would increase again. And, and then it will have an overshoot. So this is something that is very, uh, so we said in the previous uh, part that the error, the energy of the error is going to zero and we clearly see it. But one of the other things we notice is that is always going to be an overshoot and undershoot, no matter what value of N we pick. And this is known as Gibbs phenomena. This is known as Gibbs phenomena, where Gibbs basically proved that you will always have, no matter what N you pick, uh, for every finite n, there will be an overshoot and undershoot of the order of 9%. So this overshoot is 1.09. Um, so this is the overshoot you're observing. And this is known as Gibbs phenomena. Gibbs actually proved it mathematically that you will always see such an overshoot for any finite n. This is, we are talking about 1899-ish. So around 1900. So as you can see, it took about 150 years for us to understand each and every aspect of Fourier series uh, for periodic signals. Okay, so that's all I have for today. I've already overshot my time. 
uh, next class we are going to talk about discrete time oh properties of fourier transform and then discrete time fourier transform okay i'll stick around if you have any questions <laughs>